All right, good morning, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Daniel Gero. Daniel joined our department about three years ago as a Bioetic Research Fellow and is about to defend his PhD thesis in spring next year. He's in his seventh year of residency and will talk about hiatal hernia repair, reflux disease in the context of bariatric surgery. We're very much looking forward to your talk, Daniel. Thank you very much for this kind introduction. Good morning. Happy to be here today to give an overview on hiatal hernia, reflux disease, and bariatric surgery. First of all, I'd like to emphasize that both GERD and obesity are chronic diseases, and the role of surgery is reserved to the treatment of the tip of the iceberg, while the vast majority of patients may benefit from conservative uh, therapy, including uh, pharmacotherapy or lifestyle modifications. So who should we operate? According to the Swiss Society of Morbid Obesity, patients with a BMI over 40 qualify for bariatric surgery, as well as those who have a BMI over 35 with obesity-related comorbidity. In the near future, probably um, this criteria will be expanded to patients with BMI over 30 with a type 2 diabetes mellitus. Uh, regarding GERD, according to the latest consensus conference report of the European Association of Endoscopic Surgery, patients with continuous reduced quality of life, persistent troublesome symptoms, and progression of disease despite adequate PPI therapy are those who may benefit from a surgical uh, anti-reflux therapy. So today we're going to talk about the epidemiology of obesity and GERD, the anatomy of the gastroesophageal junction, the preoperative workup, which needs to be done when we are planning a procedure to treat obesity and GERD concomitantly, the surgical options, and at the end I would like to flesh up some innovative surgical procedures. It is needless to, to talk much about uh, how prevalent obesity is in the world. In the last four decades, the uh, prevalence has tripled, and it, it um, is present not only on Western countries, but in the third world countries such as South America, Central America, Middle East, uh, in Australia, according to the World Health Organization, we talk about obesity above BMI 30, uh, severe obesity above BMI 35, uh, morbid obesity above BMI 40, and super obesity above BMI 50. Regarding the prevalence of GERD, uh, data is a bit more complicated to, to collect because the definition is based on the self-report of the patients, according to the Montreal Consensus of the definition of GERD. So GERD is a condition which develops when the reflux of gastric content causes troublesome symptoms and or complications. In industrialized countries, the prevalence of GERD is between 1 and 20 percent. However, you can see that there are some countries where the prevalence is above 25 percent, for example, in India. An important paper published in 2006 in New England Journal of Medicine, uh, it has been shown that there's an association between BMI and reflux symptoms. And interestingly, it is uh, already present in the healthy range of BMI between 20 and 25. And actually, obesity is the main risk factor for the development of GERD together with tobacco. So that would be my first question to the residents. What is the pathophysiological driver of obesity to, uh, to um, trigger GERD? Good. So. Uh, <laughs> Obesity uh, increases the frequency of esophageal motility abnormalities, it increases the postprandial transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, it increases intragastric pressure. Furthermore, it adversely affects the outcome of anti-reflux uh, uh, procedures, and there's more and more data uh, showing that a failed uh, reflux procedure in an obese patient may benefit from a conversion of fund application to and y gastric bypass. Next, I would like to talk about the anatomy of the gastroesophageal junction. The esophagus comes from the thoracic cavity to the abdominal cavity between the diaphragmatic crura above the uh, aorta. And this is a very important region because it represents the physiologic anti-reflux barrier. Uh, for this barrier to be optimal, uh, the lower esophageal sphincter needs to be supported by the diaphragmatic muscles, and a small portion of the esophagus uh, must um, be in the intra-abdominal position. This uh, red line shows the so-called his angle, which is the angle between the cardia and the uh, esophagus. And um, when the angle is acute, there is this uh, physiologic anti-reflux valve that protects esophagus from acidity. If the angle becomes flat, there is a higher chance for patients to develop reflux. 
On this figure, you can see that the sliding hiatus hernia can completely disrupt the uh, physiologic anti-reflux barrier by pushing the lower esophageal sphincter to the thoracic cavity and losing the support from the diaphragmatic muscles. Further, in this herniated part of the upper stomach, there is um, constantly acidity that can be in contact with the distal part of the esophagus. Beyond the uh, uncomfortable uh, symptoms of a GERD, there might be also histologic changes due to this disease. As you can see in this endoscopic view, uh, patients are prone to develop esophagitis. They might have chronic ulcerations and might, may develop Barrett metaplasia, which is a precancerous state. So now I'd like to talk about preoperative workup. When we are planning surgery for patients uh, with obesity and GERD, it's important to perform preoperative gastroscopy. This can confirm or identify a hiatal hernia. It is uh, allowing us to perform biopsy for suspect lesions and also to look for the presence of Helicobacter pylori, which needs to be eradicated before surgery or to identify gastritis. Next, it is also recommended to perform a 24-hour pH metry, which can be done on an ambulatory basis. Patients uh, need to um, hold a tube in the esophagus, which is connected to a variable device, which records data continuously. This allows us to, to have an idea on the frequency and severity of reflux and differentiate acid reflux from biliary reflux. Esophageal manometry is also an important item of the preoperative workup. It may identify motility dysfunction, it may identify the position and strength of the lower esophageal sphincter, and also identify transient relaxation of the lower esophageal sphincter, which is increased in obesity. Um, it is also recommended to perform a barium swallow, or the so-called upper GI series, which can help to confirm hiatal hernia, supports the planning of the surgery, and can differentiate sliding hiatus hernia from paraesophageal hernia. Patients who are symptomatic from uh, GERD uh, after bariatric surgery, abdominal CT is often part of the preoperative workup. Here, a pathognomonic feature of hi sliding hiatal hernia is the presence of the staple line uh, above the diaphragmatic crura. Here in this picture under, you can see that part of the pouch is herniated. So what are the surgical options? Regarding GERD, um, an evidence-based approach to treatment of this disease published in JAMA Surgery three years ago states that laparoscopic fund application is the mainstay of surgical therapy with Ruan Y gastric bypass reserved for morbidly obese patients presenting GERD. Regarding bariatric surgery, the armamentarium of surgical procedures is quite wide. When we look into what happened in the last decade, we can see that there is a very steady increase in the uh, total number of procedures performed in the world. And uh, since 2014, interestingly, sleeved gastrectomy became the most widely performed procedures, while uh, Ruan Y gastric bypass is the second uh, most frequently performed procedure. We can all, all also see that uh, adjustable gastric banding has almost gone completely out of the business, and there is a sl slight increase of omega loop gastric bypass. This data was collected by the self report of surgeons who are members of the International Federation of Surgical mm -hmm. Obesity Association, so they might not be 100% accurate. When we look in the data from Switzerland, which is derived from the Bundesamt of Gesundheit uh, based on administrative database containing CHOP codes and uh, ICD codes, we see that uh, trends in Switzerland do not mirror trends of the world. The last six, seven years, Ruan Y gastric bypass was the most frequently performed bariatric procedures. And nevertheless, we can see that this blue um, uh, bar plot shows the increase of sleep gastrectomy over the last years. Interestingly, the uptake of sleeve gastrectomy in Switzerland is not homogeneous. In French-speaking and uh, Italian-speaking Switzerland, there is kind of a reluctance to perform uh, sleeve gastrectomy, whereas in central Switzerland, sleeve gastrectomy became quite popular. To perform the logistic regression to identify factors of uh, primary bariatric procedure decision, and actually GERD and hiatal hernia are significantly influencing the choice of uh, a gastric bypass and decreasing uh, the choice of sleeve gastrectomy. And this choice observed in a Swiss database may mirror data coming from high quality evidence, including randomized control studies. I would like to, to present some data from the SMBOS trial. It is important because our department participated to this study. 
um, out of which the last, present, last study was um, published of the five years result in JAMA surgery last year. This study included over 200 patients with a primary endpoint weight loss. But in this publication, there's also some data on secondary endpoints, uh, including uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. And uh, here, uh, it has been found that uh, RUNY gastric bypass performs better in patients who had GERD at baseline, uh, had a remission in 60% of cases, uh, which happened only in 25% of cases after sleep gastrectomy. And uh, also, interestingly, it was found that um, asymptomatic patients at baseline had sometimes developed de novo GERD, which happened 30% of cases after sleep gastrectomy and only 10% of cases in the RUNY gastric bypass arm. However, in this study, the postoperative definition of GERD was liberal. It, it did not obligatory um, include pH metry. And actually, the entire uh, medical literature, there's a, a paucity of data regarding pH metry after bariatric surgery. There's a recent publication from Byrne that included uh, 47 patients who were symptomatic of reflux after UNY gastric bypass to undergo pH metry. And I would like to uh, emphasize two interesting findings of this study. One is that uh, only 60% of these re uh, reflux um, patients had an acid reflux. And another interesting finding was that um, the presentation uh, was a bit atypical. Less than 20% of the patients complained of heartburn and regurgitation, while the majority of patients had uh, obstructive symptoms and pain. pH metry after sleep gastrectomy is also scarce in the literature. A group from Greece uh, had a different approach and included 12 patients who were asymptomatic at baseline who underwent a pH metry, and then they repeated this exam one year after surgery. What they found is that the percentage of total time with a pH under 4 increased from 4% to 13%, and the total number of reflux episodes almost doubled. The effect of bariatric surgery on barat metaplasia is shown is, um, in the next two slides. UNY gastric bypass has been shown to be able to uh, uh, achieve regression in patients who had uh, Barrett's metaplasia and baseline in around 42% of cases. And the opposite was observed after sleep gastrectomy. In this study, 17% um, of patients undergoing sleep gastrectomy presented the Barrett's metaplasia five years after surgery. Therefore, the authors of this study state that uh, Barrett metaplasia after sleep gastrectomy is possible underestimated long-term complication. The worst complication after bariatric surgery is development of uh, uh, carcinoma. There are some case reports showing that this may happen after sleeve gastrectomy, but also after gastric bypass. The advantage of gastric bypass here is that the um, excluded stomach is available for the reconstruction of the conduit after esophagectomy. So my second question to the residents would be, what may be the explanations of the beneficial effects of UNY gastric bypass on GERD symptomatology? Yes, please. Um, the deviation of, of general juices from the stomach and maybe also biliary tract. Generally yes, reflux yes. symptomatics just because um, the surface is smaller mm -hmm. and obviously the, the connection of the biliary tract is more proximal. Oh, sorry, distal. Yes. Um, I think the uh, acid-producing cells in the stomach are mainly found in the corpus, and this one is removed, right? So it should lower the acid in total. Yes, correct. So as you said, there's a deviation of gastric juice, avoidance of balliary reflux, and decrease of intragastric pressure. And overall, patients lose weight, so um, this also contributes to the decrease of GERD. However, we have seen that the efficacy is not 100%. There might be some cases when uh, RUNY gastric bypass is not uh, efficient for the treatment of GERD. In this slide, I try to summarize the potential causes, which may be related to esophageal motility disorders, hiatal hernia, a, a big size of gastric pouch, the presence of candy cane syndrome, which is a redundant uh, alimentary limb at the site of the anastomosis, which can create stasis and thus be, uh, uh, patients may be prone to, to develop reflux. The treatment is quite simple. We just need to resect this, this part and, and it, most of the cases solves the problem. Other factors that may uh, contribute to post-bariatric uh, 
GERD is um, a too short alimentary limb or a stenosis at the jejunal jejunal anastomosis, which can create stasis and, and reflux. Now I'd like to touch uh, on some innovative surgical procedures in this context. Um, when patients after sleep gastrectomy um, are, are complaining of uh, reflux, a uh, first-line therapy may be indicated to, to prescribe PPIs and as a backup to convert uh, to RUNY gastric bypass. However, some patients may, may not want to undergo RUNY gastric bypass, and for those isolated cases, we may uh, consider uh, implantation of electrodes to stimulate the um, lower esophageal junction. A pilot study came out from Bern last year, and the initial results were promising. I, however, I, I learned recently that this company producing the device has gone bankrupt. Uh, Another option may be the implantation of the links, which we also use in the general population. Here the idea is to put a magnetic ring on the lower esophageal junction to prevent acidity reflux. When I spent a year as a resident in Paris, Professor Marmus was very uh, enthusiastic about the combination of the heel repair and sleeve gastrectomy. Here the idea is that we use a previously validated reflux surgery in patients who undergo bariatric surgery or who complain of a post-bariatric reflux, and there is no necessity to perform um, uh, fund application in this context. Uh, we, we, we should perform a posterior chiroplasty and attach the GI junction to, to this chiroplasty to prevent a, a hiatal hernia uh, later. A group from Montpellier went even further and described the Nissan sleeve operation. This, this can only be performed at the time of the sleeve, not uh, as a post-bariatric backup intervention. They, they describe the performance of a 360-degree wrap and then sleeve gastrectomy. Problem with this procedure is that uh, a learning curve is quite steep. There are not many people doing this operation worldwide, and there might be a concern about the devascularization of the wrap, which can lead to devastating consequences. A recent publication from Spain described the use of the ligamentum teres hepatis to perform a cardiopexy, again with the idea to prevent hiatal hernia after the operation. Just by looking at the so many different ways to treat the problem of GERD and obesity same times, uh, sends the message that uh, this problem needs to be solved. And uh, I also would like to emphasize that the pharmacology therapy is not without side effects. Beyond the problem of cost and compliance issues, there are some papers that describe that uh, in patients who take long-term PPI therapy, there may be an increased risk of pancreatic cancer or a weak but still increased risk of uh, bone fracture, hypomagnesemia, cardiovascular diseases, pneumonia, or renal diseases. So to sum up, I think it's important to know that sleeve gastrectomy has become the most widely performed bariatric procedure worldwide. Nevertheless, the risk of GERD and Barrett is higher in sleeve gastrectomy than in gastric bypass. Therefore, gastric bypass is the procedure of choice to treat obesity and GERD at the same time. And in patients who develop post-bariatric GERD, it's a first-line therapy, we should consider PPI treatment. And as a backup, a conversion from sleeve to bypass together with chiroplasty is uh, also legitimate. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take questions. Well, thank you very much for this nice presentation. Um, are there any questions from the audience? Comments? Yes. <laughs> Why I'm not surprised. <laughs> Thanks, Daniel, for this excellent talk. Uh, just a technical remark. With the pH metry, you don't exclude biliary reflux. You just measure the, the, the acid. Yeah. Uh, but you can't really measure uh, bile. Therefore, you need the Billitec device, which is not used widely. And with impedance, you can have an estimate of non-acid reflux, but not biliary, because you don't uh, measure the, the biliary bean as a marker uh, of biliary reflux. Uh, the other thing is, um, I was wondering, how do you deal with precancerous um, lesions in the distal esophagus when you have uh, Barrett's metaplasia, short segment, long segment, um, when you have um, dysplasia, so uh, low-grade or high-grade dysplasia, would this be a contraindication for bariatric surgery? Because uh, you have an increased risk for developing an esophageal adenocarcinoma, and uh, this could be difficult to treat uh, uh, during the further course of the patient. That's a tricky question, and it's a, it's a rare situation. We rarely see that. Um, I... You know that that would have to be discussed interdisciplinary. I have to be. I have to say. You know, I wouldn't 
just go for a bariatric operation. What I certainly wouldn't do is a sleeve gastrectomy for the reasons that Daniel mentioned, because if you do a sleeve gastrectomy, you lose all or, you know, the, the obvious chances for reconstruction. Um, you know, if you have someone with severe obesity would, who then would have a high operative risk, even for an esophagectomy, it might be wise even to do a gastric bypass and uh, ensure regular follow-up of that lesion by half-year or annual uh, endoscopies and then get him into a lower BMI range which makes it technically easier later on to do an esophagectomy even. Because then you still have the stomach remnant for the reconstruction. Because for a classic anti-reflux surgery in patients with uh, Barrett's esophagus we have a quite a, a clear way how to proceed because uh, we don't perform uh, anti-reflux surgery in patients who uh, display uh, dysplasia. Okay, because the risk is too high. In patients with a simple non-dysplastic uh, metaplasia, so a Barrett's esophagus, there, there can uh, uh, anti-reflux surgery can be absolutely beneficial. Yes. And another question is, uh, how do you deal with the different types of hiatal hernia? You have type 1, the sliding hernia. You have uh, also paraesophageal hernias. When do you perform a simple hyatoplasty with stitches? When do you put in additional meshes? What kind of meshes do you, would you use? This is quite a difficult question, I'm, I'm afraid, because even in the, in the standard situation uh, when re operating hiatal hernias, this is not really clear. There's no clear rule how to proceed, but what is your experience? You know, I would like to start with a comment on this dysplasia, metaplasia comment that you made. To the best of my knowledge, the fund application does not reduce the risk of development of metaplasia to dysplasia. So you can do an anti-reflux procedure, but it does not lower the risk to develop esophageal cancer. And although that is, you know, reports on case level, um, to, to my knowledge, the gastric bypass is the only operation where there are reports that a Barrett metaplasia can be, you know, um, gone into remission and it's not being found. Whether that is due to some endoscopic way of looking at it, that might be. But at least there are some reports that you can, you know, turn the course of that disease, which is not true for um, fundal palpation. If you talk about hiatal hernias, uh, I have to say that the experience in the context of bariatric surgery with higher hill classified hiatal hernias is limited. We rarely see paraesophageal hernias. Usually we see sliding hiatal hernias as Daniel has shown. And, you know, in the 10 years I'm here now, I have not witnessed one case where this hiatal hernia was so big that a mesh would have been necessary. So our usual approach, because that is due to the regular size of this hiatal hernia, is to do a chororaphy. If you do a sleeve gastrectomy, you definitely have to do it, uh, even in the smaller hiatal hernias. With the gastric bypass, it's not that clear. If you have a very small hiatal hernia, there are many surgeons who advocate to do nothing because by having that traction on that pouch through that gastrojejunostomy, you automatically reduce that hiatal hernia. I'm not sure whether that is true, but data are scarce. But the bigger the hiatal hernia is, at least in our service, we have, uh, you know, we have the approach to take care of that too with a cruel refi. Thank you very much. Uh, I like the data on uh, showing the differences in a small country like Switzerland where you have more sleeve gastrectomies in the German part than in the French part. Are there any reasons for that? Are there more surgeons in the German part doing these procedures than in the French part? Because somehow we have feeling that a sleeve gastrectomy is the easier procedure, even, even though it might not really be the easier procedure. Thank you for this question. Actually, this is, this is exactly the question that we were asking ourselves when we prepared this abstract submission last month for the ESA. And uh, based on the da available data, um, there might be some influencing factor related to the demography of the patients. Ma male sex was a, a factor that um, was favoring sleeve gastrectomy. Extremes of ages was another factor. So patients between 10 and 19 years old and over 60 years old, the higher uh, odds to, to have a sleeve gastrectomy. Th those patients with a metabolic comorbidity, including diabetes, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, also higher odds to, to have a sleeve gastrectomy. 
and uh, patients with a non-private insurance had higher odds. But clearly the, the highest influencing um, factor was the linguistic region and we don't exactly know why. It's probably related to the patient's um, desire or the influence of local social media communities or the, the local practice of surgeon. Yeah, did you look at the demographics of the surgeons? This was not uh, possible in this database, um, unfortunately, because we got it from the governmental database, which is anonymized, and we had only access to the domiciliation of the patients, but not in the location of the center. So we, we don't have that data, but it's tempting to, to speculate. You know, I mean, there are several data out there advocating one or the other procedure, if you have that comorbidity or that factor, but it's obvious that all these factors are overruled by personal preferences <laughs> and that, you know, personal preferences of the patients or even of the surgeons. This, this topic has been investigated in the US and what they found is that bariatric practices are, are quite uh, uh, monosynaptic. They are those who perform mainly uh, sleeve gastrectomies and other mainly gastric bypass, independently of the comorbidities of the patient. Good. They're not more comments, I think we can close. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.